It's a final word with Adam Collins and Jeff Lemon, and we're here at the Essex County Cricket Club at Chelmsford, where England's women are starting a, a three-game T20 series against the Proteas, and we have Proteas batter Laura Wolvart with us, 23-year-old uh, superstar of the South African game, uh, and you've just uh, come off a, a three-game one-day series where you were soundly beaten, uh, the last of those in the heat. Uh, how was that to start with, playing in absurd weather at Leicestershire a couple of days ago? Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, it was a lot hotter than I expected it ever to be in England, uh, so definitely not what we were planning for. Um, it was very, very warm, very long, we fielded first. Um, and yeah, it's never nice to, to field in the heat and then see the balls flying everywhere mm. when they scored 330-something. Um, so yeah, tough game, but hopefully we can start the T20 series with a fresh mindset. I mentioned you're 23. It feels like we've been following your career for ages and ages, owing to how young you were when you made your international debut and that breakout World Cup in 2017, and we'll kind of go through all of that. But you're very much a senior player now at that relatively young age and early stage of your career. Do you sense that in this team, that, that your responsibility is greater than it might otherwise be for an ordinary 23-year-old? Yeah, I think it's a it's a bit of a fortunate position to be in, I guess. Um, I don't think there's a lot of 23-year-olds who've been able to play as many games as I have. Um, so it's, it's cool. I guess I was a bit young when I first debuted, if I look back on it now. Um, but I'm very yeah, lucky to have played 70-odd ODIs um, by the age of 23. You also got to play a test match this summer, which it feels like it's been such a long time coming. You know, 2014, the last time South Africa played. Uh, you've had, like we said, quite a lengthy career, even by this stage, uh, by this age. But you got to actually have that moment and, and there might be more to come. <laughs> We're a little bit in the firing line here with Shadim Ismail batting in the net behind us, but we'll do the best we can as we work our way through it. <laughs> Sorry, please pick it up, Laura. Um, yeah, uh, test match was incredible. Um, incredible experience to be a part of. Um, it was definitely something that I'd been looking forward to since I was a little girl. Um, and to be able to, to play one quite early in my career was, was amazing. Uh, hopefully it's the first of many and that I can play a few more. Um, even though it didn't quite go my way and I didn't get to bat that long, I think it's something that I really enjoy going forward. Um, and a format that I'd definitely like to play some more. I think when you first burst onto the scene back in 2017, a lot of people said you'd be really well suited to test cricket, but we feared we'd never see you sort of in that format. A lot of your colleagues around the world have been saying, making the case for more women's test cricket, um, I suppose you're happy to put your voice to that as well and I guess apply some pressure internally to um, those at CSA and those around the world that you want to play in the Whites more often. Yeah, I'd absolutely love to. Um, obviously, yeah, I think there was a lot of, I put a lot of pressure on myself going into that one test match because um, I thought it's something that I would enjoy and I thought we just had the one so it might be uh, my last chance. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'd really hope that there's more, learn, more in the future. Um, I wouldn't want that to be my only test match ever. Um, so yeah, I would love to play some more and hopefully bet a bit longer next time. In this series, I mentioned off the top that the one days haven't gone quite so well. In the past when you've been interviewed, you've talked about the fact that you think the team you play in is super talented and when it doesn't go well, it's usually uh, above the shoulders, that you haven't got everything quite clicking sort of uh, mentally, which is obviously a massive part of the game. Is that your assessment as to what's happened in, in the one days over the last week or so? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we're a really talented group of players. Um, we're not that different to the, to the side that was playing in the World Cup recently and we played some good cricket over there. Um, so I think something's just not quite clicking for us at the moment. Um, but I think we've got a, a lot of T20s coming up now in the next couple of months. So I think we just need a new mindset, uh, refresh a little, um, put the ODI behind us and just take the positive forward hopefully so take us right back to the start for your life where does cricket come into it you know where where does that where do you start hearing that song and start getting <laughs> interested in in the game and being drawn in um i started when i was about five years old um i was just friends with a lot of boys at school and when we turned five they all started playing cricket in break time and i just tagged <laughs> along um and yeah i just absolutely fell in love with the game uh, from a very young age already um so I've just been playing for as long as I can remember and have always loved batting a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, it kind of just grew from, from there and very, very fortunate to be able to do it every day now. And what was your upbringing like? To tell us about your, your childhood, uh, your family, how you grew up. Ball coming our way again, not coming our way. <laughs> Clear. Um, <laughs> Clear, just. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, upbringing, I come from Bloberg in Cape Town. So uh, we live on the beach, uh, Monaton side, uh, very nice, sunny, um, 
Yeah, I went to school in Parklands College. Uh, that's where I started playing cricket. Um, and I was there for my whole schooling career until the end of matric. Um, right. So, yeah, I was able to, to stay at the same school and kind of it just grew from there. Went to women's girls western province trials um at the time though there was only under 19 uh, we didn't have age group level or anything so i started playing under 19 very young um you were like 13 when you were yeah that. yeah i was very young and then sa under 19 when i was 13 mm. wow and then um moved on to western province women and then sa women at 16. so were you mostly playing with older like girls and yeah. women in that under 19 like yeah. what's that like coming in as you know you're a little kid basically in, in a team where at the upper end they're young adults yeah I think um, I was very young I still remember because once a year we'd have a, a provincial week where all the teams would come together and my first week I was like 11 or 12 um, and Chloe Tryon was actually a fast bowler back then uh, bowling some gas left arm quick pace uh, so yeah, I remember being a little bit a little bit nervous to face the then 18-year-old Chloe Tryon. Um, so I'm glad we have have age groups now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's a bit dangerous throwing some 11 or 12-year-olds in there. Um, but yeah, I think I, I had to learn to to sink or swim pretty quickly. Um, so yeah. Are you still scared of it? Ah uh, no, she both spin now, so it's all good. <laughs> well, no, I mean, but when she comes into bat in the nets, we might be in some yeah, danger. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> scared sitting here right now. <laughs> tell tell Shabnam to hit offside. Yeah, got to. I think we'll be okay. I've kind of got the angle game. right here where I'm looking over your okay. left shoulder, and I can see her facing and I got every the chair ball. Here so for, in the yeah. unlikely event that's yeah. coming our way, I'll jump over your shoulder and make sure it doesn't hit you. Okay. So yeah, right yeah. here, for example, <laughs> uh, again, it's uh, back over long on. Anyway, um, so yeah, that that you being a bit of a prodigy of sorts, you know, playing at such a young age for the South African 19s. Then at 16, you're playing international cricket. You make your debut against England in, uh, and, and make a half century in your second game. On your first tour in 2016, as a 17-year-old, you become uh, the youngest ever cricketer, man or woman, uh, to make a century uh, for your country. Um, that's against Ireland at, at Malahide. Um, I mean, it's quite something, isn't it, that you get thrown in, not the deep end, but you know, you're playing international cricket so young, they think you're ready. Um, do you think to an extent you were almost liberated at that age just to kind of see ball, hit ball and weren't necessarily thinking too much about it, which might account for your early success? Yeah, exactly that. Um, I think it was a really fun time for me. I, I didn't know much about what I had to do or who the bowlers were or what the opposition were doing. Um, I didn't know who Catherine Brunt was in my opening game and right. she was bo- opening the bowling against me. Um, so I think that actually all played to, uh, in my advantage. Um, I think the, the season after that people figured me out a little um, and then I started overthinking and thinking about all the big names in the bowlers and then I had a not so great season afterwards. Um, so yeah, I think just coming in with no expectations and just hitting the ball actually went quite well. Um, but yeah, I, I had to, to adapt pretty quickly because people figured out that I had one shot at the cover drive and that was about it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I needed to add a bit more. So what's that like when you're you're suddenly having to adapt your game on the run, but also you know you're 17 at that point. You're still you're still a kid, really. You're still developing, and then you've got this big challenge ahead of you. Yeah, um, strange position to be in. Um, I think yeah, just because we didn't really have the age group cricket and the the structures when I was growing up, um, it was a bit difficult. And I have to kind of I I came onto the scene not being you know complete if you know what I mean yeah. um, so yeah. I had to keep adapting as I was playing as a youngster um, I'm still learning so much um, I think at 23 now I'm officially no longer the youngster in the side yeah. um, which is new for me yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah I'm, I'm, I'm happy <laughs> so when we were watching you in, in 2017 in that World Cup for instance you know the notable thing was how classical how upright you were it was it was all drives through the offside you know mid off cover cover point and and oftentimes you would you'd hit those fielders now this might sound like a really rudimentary analysis than it is but like these days you seem much more proficient at hitting the gaps rather than hitting the field whereas at the time it was like that's a gorgeous shot to mid off but it's gone straight to the field and you can't yeah. score is that is that a stupid analysis or is that actually no definitely reflective? um I think I definitely had the tendency to dot up quite a bit in the power play. I um, also f- wasn't as strong as I am now. I think we have a, a new fitness trainer, Zane, and right. I've been working really hard with him just to, to get a bit more power into my game. Um, I was a bit skinny and lanky when I was 16, 17, and yeah. didn't really have much power behind yeah. the ball. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of areas I've tried to improve in, um, power hitting, hitting the gaps, um, using my leg side a bit more. Um, it's still all the work in progress, um, 
but I think my last two games again against England, I started a bit faster, which is something that I've been looking to do. Yeah, let, let's go back to that 2017 World Cup when you kind of come onto our radar, for example. And a lot of people that follow the global game, you're like, wow, averaging 65 in a tournament. You know, you're 17, you're hitting these glorious cover drives. You know, the, the Teen Wolf uh, phenomenon, as it were, all these yeah. stories written about you. You're getting a lot of attention, I suppose, is where I'm steering this question to. What it was, what was it like suddenly, as a you know, as a teenager at your first major tournament, having everybody talking about you? Oh, I just really enjoyed the tournament. Um, I think I was still in that phase where I didn't really know who the opposition were or who the other teams were. Um, I was just there to bat as long as I could and, and enjoy <laughs> it. Um, and yeah, it it went really well for me. I think. Um, being new on the scene, the other teams didn't really know what I what I did, um, so that kind of played into my advantage a little bit. Um, right. Yeah, um, the World Cup now, I had to think a bit more about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was a cool experience to, to be a part of it that young. Yeah, where, so where, does, where does that classical technique come from in your development? Very good. Um, <laughs> I, I have had the same coach since I was like five years old at home, right. uh, Laurie Ward. And he, at his indoor center, he has like the cameras and the, the vision and slow-mos. And him and I have always really focused on technique. Um, we just felt that if the technique is right, then then we can build off of that. Because um, if you have like a fundamental flaw in your technique, then there's no point in working on something else. Um, so that was kind of our main focus. Um, and then growing up, yeah, I had the good technique, but didn't really have the options of the power. So then that was kind of the next phase is just trying to, trying to add bit, a bit more of that. Mm bit more bottom hand, a bit more yeah. options against spin. If, we used to yeah. notice once the spinners came on that yeah. you, you seemed less sure of how to yeah. manage that. Yeah, just a lot of indoors and ball machine growing up, uh, especially in Cape Town in the winter. We don't have any turf nets available. Right. Um, so it's been a lot of hours just facing seamers and ball machine. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, just had to really slow it down, uh, spend more time on outdoor wickets. That dressing room you walked into, in, uh, it's, been a, it's been a lot of interest in, in the South African women's team all these talented players coming through at the same time. A bit of a golden generation of sorts, and you're at the younger end of that, but players like Denis Van Inkirk and Marazan Kapp, and you mentioned Chloe Tryon playing with you at the moment, but someone who can be a, a genuine game changer. Uh, Mignon Dupria, former captain as well. Uh, the through line with a lot of those players is heavily religious, and, and that dressing room, you know, often taking the knee and praying before going out to field. And um, what was that like, kind of walking into a dressing room that has that sort of strong connection uh, with spirit and religion? Um, I'm personally not religious, so for me, yeah, I just, I didn't mind it. Uh, they, we used to pray on the field, we don't do it anymore just because we have a, a very multi-cultural team and everyone has their own thing and their own religion going on. Um, so nowadays we don't do that anymore. Interesting, um, okay. And those who want to pray can have their own um, group and do that before the game. Um, but it's no longer a sort of a forced thing. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, because I think before me there weren't a lot of players who weren't uh, Christian in the right. side, um, but now we're we're a lot more diverse nowadays. So everyone just does their own thing. So was when it, you were at, when you came into that sort of environment, was it just the expectation that you, you'd be part of it, even yeah. though you weren't religious? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that must we, have been a little bit unusual. Yeah, I can't imagine it what it was like. It was yeah. a bit uh, unusual for me. Uh, growing up, I wasn't in a religious household or anything mm. like that. Um, so I think um, having come into the side not being religious, I think the team just realised and we just had a bit of a chat about it um, okay. and just agreed that we wouldn't do that anymore. So it was a developing sensitivity yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as time went on? Yeah. yeah okay. Interesting. Um, after that um, 17 World Cup, not long after that, you go to Australia for the first time. Do I there was big bash yeah. with the heat to begin with, yeah. wasn't it? Uh, that must have been, again, you know, you, there's that experience of going to England in that controlled environment, national team, but suddenly women's big bash league, professional, but kind of like a gap year sort of as well. I yeah. know you were finishing high school just before then. Is that how you interpret that time in your life when you were just becoming a, an adult and flourishing as a cricketer, but also getting the chance to kind of grow up a little bit in Australia? Yeah, that was a really cool experience for me. Um, it was sort of the first time that I'd gone away on my own without the SA team. Um, right. I was very young looking back now. Um, yeah, I don't know if my T20 grain was was quite ready for that yet. Yeah. Um, but I do think that my time over there was, was crucial for me um, developing my game. Um, I think I learned a lot there. The coach at the time, uh, Pete McGiffin at the Heat, mm -hmm. was amazing. Um, he took me in like a like I was his stepdaughter or whatever. And I even stayed in his house uh, with his family for a bit. And we just have net session after net session um, and just worked on a lot of T20 things. So I do think I learned a lot in those two years with the Heat. Um, obviously, like scores-wise, it didn't 
didn't go that well for me, but I think it was crucial for my development. But they were doing all kinds of odd things with you as well, right? They were throwing you out yeah. the order. You were coming in at number eight or eight, nine yeah. sometimes to hit. Yeah. It was it was strange to work it out, but maybe that's the cricket version of a wild experimental gap here. You know? yeah. I'm going to go overseas and bat none. Yeah, I'm going to go wild. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least, I mean, I guess you were having that day-to-day existence as a professional cricketer. And I'm interested in that as it influenced the eventual decision you had to make, the big decision. I suppose the two things that people know about you, your cover drive and the fact that you got admitted to medical school yeah. and decided not to go <laughs> yeah. ahead with it. Let's go into that a little bit. So in 17, when we first met you and all the rest of it, that, that was the big decision. Stellenbosch University yeah. give you the place. They give you 12 months to basically work it out and decide yeah. whether you're going to go ahead with it. What were the decision, what were the main factors that uh, led you down the path of becoming a full-time professional cricketer with South Africa and taking one of the initial contracts of 14 that were handed out in 2018 rather than studying medicine full-time? Yeah, it was a very difficult time for me um, because my my whole high school career I'd done everything I could to get into med school. Um, It's very hard to get in back home. and yeah I even took French as a subject so I'd have more language points really? and I I always thought I was playing cricket to, to help me get points to get into medicine right. and it was all just right. cricket was always just the hobby just on the side um, and then I got accepted into med school and I went to med school and then after about a month or two um, the cricket calendar started filling up for the year um, and I spoke to the head of department and I asked like could I do some of these tours and then they said you can maybe do one but you can't do four or five tours a year um, so then they gave me the the year of um, trying to figure out what I would do and they would keep my spot for me um, which then turned into two years because I said I wasn't ready um, and yeah by the end of the two years I think I was already so into the cricket and um, I was feeling like I was a big part of this team now and playing in some of the big bash leagues um, and I just I couldn't stop um, I don't think I was ready I'm still not ready to, to give up my cricket yet um, yeah medicine is quite full on and I feel like if you're there you have to be 100% in it and mm. it becomes your life um, but I wasn't ready to fully stop the cricket yet it's a real turning upside down though of, of the, you know the priorities like you say you're playing sport in order to to beef up your academic record to get admitted to a university and then suddenly you have to make the choice the other yeah. way was that did that sort of make you have to confront like who who am I as a person like what do I what am I doing with the life that I have ahead of me yeah. you know when you're when you're younger and you're a teenager you have this one idea of this is the thing I'm going to do and then suddenly that's all changed exactly um my entire life growing up I'd always wanted to be a doctor it was kind of the singular thing I was working towards mm. um studied many long hours in school to get there um so it was a really big call to to stay with cricket and yeah, I think as well, because medicine is like a stable future, it's a, a long-term thing, but cricket could change overnight. Um, but I guess the way I, I saw it was that um, if I wanted to, I could always try and go back to medicine um, yeah. if cricket didn't work out at all. Um, but I think cricket, I had my chance now while I'm still young. Right. So I guess I had to had to do it now. And I, I guess the fact that you're still studying, right? Like you're doing yeah. your Bachelor of Science at yeah. the moment on the road. Yeah. A lot of long nights in the hotel room, I suppose. Yeah. Hotel quarantine might have helped a little bit in the it last did. two years it with that. It was great. Yeah, um, definitely not ideal to be studying on tour, um, but it's something I have to get through. Uh, that was my parents' one rule. They said, fine, you can give up medicine, but you have to study something. Um, <laughs> so I said, fair enough. Um, so I'm doing the Bachelor of Science through UNISA. It's like an online university at home. Right. Um, so everything's online, which is really cool. I can take my books with me on the iPad and just study in the room. Must give you some precious balance too. I mean, there are some well-documented examples of cricketers who, who only do cricket at the exclusion of seemingly everything else. And I don't know yeah. whether it's particularly healthy. That's my sort of pop psychology assessment from, from the cheap seats. But I mean, you know, you played hockey, you played golf, you know, you, you're studying, you, you've got other stuff going on. Um, you kind of enjoy the time. What I, my sense is, you enjoy your time away from cricket as well, and, and make the most of that to round you off as a human being. Do you think that contributes to why you're going so well as a cricketer right now? That you're not as immersed in it as you would be if you were just doing this one thing day in day out, sort of 16 hours a day. Yeah, I do think it helps. Um, especially for me, I think I'm someone who can overthink things quite a bit. Um, if I were just playing cricket, I'd probably go sit in my room and think about the game, to, uh, the right. games and the practices before. Um, so even though I don't really enjoy the study all the time especially not when I'm tired after a long day um, I think it does help break it up a bit and just take my it takes my mind completely off of cricket when I'm studying <laughs> and I suppose the other part of being a modern professional cricketer is fitness and yeah 
you know, it's easily identifiable, the 17-year-old lanky girl that you talked about from the World Cup in 17. Yeah. You are clearly a fitness machine these days. You can see it out on the field. Your game as well, the way it's evolved. Jeff mentioned that how resourceful you are as a batter, how much power you've now got. Um, I assume you're, you're spending a lot of time um, you know, fine-tuning the machine, if you like, a, a, as your body and making sure you're, you're able to continue to improve. Yeah, it's definitely something that I enjoy. Um, like I said, back then I was just a girl in high school. I didn't really go to gym much at all. Um, right. I just batted and studied. <laughs> that was basically me. Um, but yeah, now that I'm um, on tour all the time, we, we have a new trainer, Zane, and he's given us all very personalized programs. And if you stick to that, then then you're good to go. So that's what I've been doing. We should get in on that, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Get fitter. Is, is it as much uh, psychological as well, though, the way you have to attack 20 over cricket these days? It, it's not you can't sit there and hit the field and play along the ground you have to be able to go aerial you have to use at least 300 degrees if not 360 of the field you have to be able to go leg side um is it a kind of mindset shift as much as sort of physical strengthening and all of that yeah for sure um i think first i needed the the physical strength part and then it took me a couple of seasons to figure out how to go about my t20 game um i think when i was young i i thought i had to come out and and hit like a chloe or like a lazelle right or some of the big hitters in the world um and I, I just end up slogging across the line and losing all of my shapes um, so I just had to find a way to to adapt my game and how I could turn the cover drive into a t20 attacking shot type of thing um, but still sticking to who I am as a cricketer you mentioned making that deal with your parents what they're clearly still an influence tell, tell us about them yeah, they've been so supportive throughout my career. Um, they would drive me all over Cape Town. I think I've played on most grounds in Cape Town and they, they would drive me to all ends of the world. Um, yeah, and still now, um, they were actually over for the Test Match Series to, to come and watch. Um, oh, nice. So that's quite a big commitment from them to, to fly all the way from South Africa. Um, but yeah, it's actually nice because they, they didn't play cricket themselves. Um, my mom's from Belgium and my dad is a science geek. Um, so it's nice to... Uh sometimes come home and not talk about cricket at all which is cool yeah that's always one of the nicest things while traveling is meeting people who don't know anything yeah. about cricket <laughs> yes. it's like oh thank god you know we can have one evening where we don't have don't to mention do that. it whatsoever yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we'll go back to cricket now though uh and uh, yeah that, that sort of t20 development that you talk about having been a bit of a slow starter with the heat but you're part of their championship winning team in, in 18 19 i suppose having those Australian international players in the dressing room with you, I'm thinking Beth Mooney, for example. Um, it feels like all of these Australian players, as the standard bearers, must be a great influence on players when they when they come into the WBBL as an overseas. Yeah, um, now with the strikers as well, we have a couple yep. of great Aussie players, um, Talia McGrath, Darcy Brown, Megan Shute. Um, if I'm not facing them in the nets, then I'm chatting to them and trying to learn from them. So um, it's really great to, to go to these leagues and be surrounded by players like that. Um, but I guess it's a bit of a, a double side because you, you learn more about them, but I guess they totally know my game in and out because nice. I spend a lot of net sessions with them. Um, so I think you just have to keep evolving and, and trying to learn without giving too much away, I guess. The way you developed a T20 cricket, it almost mirrors the, the team you play for, South Africa, in the 2018 World Cup in the Caribbean. A, sort of a rain-affected, bit of a damp squib for, for the group that you were in. Um, yeah. In uh, St Lucia, wasn't it, where we all were in that group that didn't quite get off the ground. Um, but by 2020, uh, you are right there. Indeed, if rain had have lasted for five more minutes at the SCG, yeah. you would have made it through to the World Cup final at the MCG uh, um, against India and it didn't quite play out that way although um, you gave it your best shot making 41 not out from 27 balls or whatever it was and nearly dragged South Africa over the line but um, that experience of, of being so close yet again but a little bit different I suppose to 2017 where it felt like in 17 the team was uh, it was a great achievement to make the semi-finals whereas in 2020 it felt like had you snuck through you could have won the thing. Yeah um I think we definitely improved a lot as a T20 side. Um, I think it was just about figuring out the combinations. I think in that 2018 one in the West Indies, I was still opening the batting. Um, and then right before the 2021, um, I got thrown into the middle order. Um, and I think that was a change that actually kick-started my T20 career a little yep. bit. Um, I think in the power play, I felt a lot of pressure to, to have to hit big straight away. Um, but in the middle, I could just come in and start rotating because I'm in after the power play. Um, and I felt that suited me a bit better. Um, so yeah, I think that, that tournament in 2020 was, was a big turning point for me. It was the first time that I'd actually scored that quickly in T20 games before. So it was kind of like a, a, oh, I can also do this sort of moment. Um, and from then on, I think I've 
sort of settled a bit more into T20 cricket. Is it then a little tricky to switch back to 50 overs for if you've, you're spending so much time thinking about changing your game and adapting it and making it different and then going back to the format that initially suited you better? No, I, I really enjoy going back to 50 overs. I feel like it's like always a sigh of relief, like, oh, I can just be relaxed now, just play my game. I don't have to try too many breathe. things. <laughs> just breathe. Yeah. yeah, so I enjoy going back to it. You're very much on the circuit with T20 cricket now as well, aren't you? I mean, you mentioned playing with the strikers, playing with the superchargers in yeah. 100. Uh, you were at Fairbreak in Dubai a couple of months ago as well. Um, is that something you plan to keep on doing, being on that circuit, being on that treadmill? It means a lot of travel, of course. Yeah, a lot of travel, um, but I'm still young, so I'm still really enjoying it. Um, I get to see different places, which is yep. really cool. Um, and I'm enjoying playing with different teams and seeing how different countries go about their things. Um, I was at the, the IPL exhibition as yep. well and just seeing how the Indian, Indian setup is and just the way that they coach and stuff, which is a bit different to what we do back at home. Um, so it's cool to just learn from the different cultures and countries yeah. and see what they're doing. Domestic T20 women's cricket, I, I find this fascinating at the moment because if you look at, say, Australia with the Big Bash, mm. those kind of players we were mentioning, Beth Mooney, Talia McGrath, Sophie Molyneux, Nicola Carey, Georgia Wareham, these sort of players yeah. who come through in the Big Bash first and then make their way into the national team. Uh, and England is starting to do that more yeah. now. They've got more of those next generation of players they're bringing through who've developed at domestic level because they've invested in it. They've got a strong enough domestic system, uh, a step down, that it means it's not just like it used to be in the old days with 12 or 15 of the top players who mm -hmm. would then always dominate domestically and always be the same ones in the squad. South Africa doesn't seem to have that the strength of that next level. It, it seems to us looking on like the current national team is stronger than it should be almost it's it's disproportionately good because you've got some generationally good players and, and some of those who've recently retired but what I get our worry with South African women's cricket is whether there is a, another generation being developed who can be as good um, like, how do you see it from where you sit yeah that's that's my worry as well um, I think if you look at the Australian setup at the moment um, the depth they have is incredible um, if one spinner like Georgia Wareham gets injured then Alana King just comes in yeah. and is just as good um, which is something that I think we're struggling with and will struggle a lot more with in the future um, and with all the countries starting their leagues now with the 100 and the Big Bash and possibly IPL um, I think we're going to have to do something or we're going to fall a bit far behind um, it's going to be hard to, to keep up with it because a lot of our girls who make their debut here it would be the first time that they're facing international quality bowlers because um, our, our domestic setup at home is is um, still very amateur um, it, is that i mean is that partly to do with the financial disasters that have befallen cricket south africa in recent times like is there is there any sort of aim to correct that once if, if the finances are able to be repaired or is it is it just not even really talked about as to having some sort of roadmap for where to go yeah, I, I don't really know. Um, I hope it's something that they're looking at. Um, I think it's going to be crucial in the next five years that we also start some kind of a league. Um, so I, I hope they've made some kind of a budget for it, but we'll see what happens. Um, but I think it's definitely something that that is going to have to happen because um, some girls are debuting here and it's the first time that they've played bowlers of an international standard. Meanwhile, yeah. people in the Big Bash have played against Sophie Devine and Susie Bates for years. So. Right. But it hasn't, it's not something that's been discussed with you or with not the player. Not that I know of, no. Yeah, because there is that arms race, isn't there? You, know, you touched on it before, Jeff, but there, there are players in this England team you played one day as against this week who've now had two years of semi-pro cricket or they've been yeah. professionals in the in the semi-pro structure um, they've had the Keir Super League before that of course they've a lot of them have traveled to Australia to play in the Big Bash show I mean yeah it's a step up of course it is mm. it's international cricket but they've, I mean, they've played on television you know they've played on test venues and sure you've had the chance to do that the the group of all-stars who you kind of been yourself Lizelle Danae Marazan a number of them from South Africa have had that opportunity but if you're just coming through, you're on a bit of a hiding to nothing. I mean, it, it stands to reason that that gap might grow unless there's a correction on it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's a bit unfair on the players as well. I feel like yeah. sometimes they make their debut and they're expected to perform straight away, um, but they haven't really been prepared for it properly. Um, I think, yeah, like you said, England, Australia, their domestic players have had years of experience on, on these kind of grounds with cameras and everything. And um, I think sometimes we get thrown a bit in the deep end. Um, which, yeah, will be a challenge going forward. The timing's going to be important on that too. I mean, Mignon's pretty much finished up. She's yeah. still available in T20s, but finished up in Test and, and one-day cricket. Lizelle Lee finishing up a couple of weeks ago um, 
it, it does sort of put the emphasis on, on Generation Next. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on, on I suppose, the, the rejuvenation of the men's team and how it will recalibrate after the well-documented troubles and, and racial troubles that have been explained um, and have come out publicly in the last 12 to 18 months. My sense, again, from the cheap seats, it doesn't quite feel like you have the same issues in, in the women's team, that there's a more, um, there's a more sort of a, a sense of the importance of, of having a, a side that has that integration. Is that your interpretation as well, that you've got that box checked already? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't see any issues with that in our team. Um, I feel like we're just trying to trying to make the most of our time away together. I think um, because we've it's the first year that we've spent so much time together away from home. Um, so I think yeah, we're just all trying to enjoy each other's company, which I think is very important. And just on Liz Lee and her retirement last week, about I mean, it's not it's not as though she was a, a declining force. I mean, she was the number one player in the world yeah. last year in one day cricket. Um, that must provide a degree of frustration for the dressing room that like, one of our all-time greats is no longer there. Yeah, um, it's obviously a massive loss for our side. Um, she was an incredible player for us um, and I really enjoyed opening the batting with her as well. Yeah. I think we had a really good record together and she took a lot of pressure off of me at the top of the order. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out a little bit how I go about my game in 50 over cricket now um, just because we don't have that explosiveness that I can start with. Um, so I'm going to have to maybe adapt my game a little bit and start a bit quicker. Um, but yeah, I think that's something we'll have to figure out and we're definitely going to miss her going forward. Did that throw off the team a bit? Was it, it? I mean, it must have been unexpected. You yeah. know, suddenly one day she's there, and, and, and suddenly there are politics behind the scenes and whatever it was that was going on. But you know, one of your key players is, is dis- disappeared overnight. Yeah, obviously a bit of a shock. Um, I didn't see it coming at all. Um, but yeah, I think I'm, I don't think that's the reason why we were playing badly. I think. Um, yeah, I think we just didn't play our best cricket in England. We're a lot better better than us in all aspects of the games. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can show up a bit better in the T20s. And it's just come after a very successful World Cup. You won't feel it was a successful World Cup for having not made the final, but the way you blaze through the group stage and you personally, wonderful tournament. We'll come to that in a bit more depth in a moment here. But yeah, it feels like you've just had this, this wonderful run when you could have won a World Cup and now you have to reset. I mean mentioned before you're now a senior player there's going to be a lot of responsibility on your shoulders to help with that reset yeah um we had a good world cup i think we played some good cricket um had a lot of really tight games um uh but obviously just crash and burn in that semi-final um and it feels like we kind of are still stuck in that uh this last odi series um so i think we just we need a bit of an odi reset and talk about the brand of cricket that we want to play um I think England came out in the series and just played really aggressively, showed a lot of intent. Um, and I think we were just caught on the back back foot a little bit. Um, so I think we're just going to have to have some chats over how we want to play our cricket going forward um, and what type of cricket we want to play. Is it harder to back up for the next series when you've come so close, like you, you've just missed out, rather than if you hadn't been competitive in that World Cup, then you might want to attack the next series harder. But when you know, you're so close to something and, and it slips through your fingers... Yeah, uh, it's difficult, and I feel like we had the same thing uh, four years before. We also yep. lost to England in the semi-final, so yep. I think everyone was a bit hurt by that game and just the way we played as well. We didn't play our best cricket in that game at all. Uh, we saved our worst game for the semi-final, so I think everyone was a bit down after that. Um, and yeah, clearly something's just not clicking in this series at the moment, the ODI series. Um, Is that one of the games you replay in your head when you said you, you try not to think about cricket, you know, once you go home in the evening, but is that one that comes up? Yeah. Think, oh, <laughs> yeah. There's why a, there's why a couple. that one? Yeah. <laughs> it's a couple that pop up sometimes. <laughs> and the added frustration is sort of the one game you've missed out on almost this year. I mean, you go through the scores. I mean, you've been super consistent after making that 100 mm. against the West Indies before the World Cup. I mean, you go 23-41, 75, 67, 67, 90 in this. Uh, series you've gone 43 55 56 sorry make that mm. 53 55 56 you have had a couple of other um, big scores in the tour games as well I mean you've done pretty much everything you can personally do um, you're the quickest South African to ever reach 3,000 one day runs you're averaging 47 in the format I mean you just need players to go with you don't you yeah um, obviously it was heartbreaking to that like to have that be the one game that I didn't mm. score um, yeah. I feel like throughout the whole tournament I played my role pretty well which yep. was to, to bat long and have everyone else bat around me um, and yeah obviously that game was the one where it didn't work out um, and yeah I, I'm the player who needs to take that responsibility and, and provide the structure for the rest to bat around me um, mm. and bat long and then the others can play their natural game um, 
and yeah obviously yeah when I went out I feel like um, that wasn't there and it was the first game that it didn't happen in the tournament sort of so and cricket is a psychologically brutal game in that way you know there's always there's always the moment where something doesn't work and that will stay with you much more than the 20 moments where things do work and that sort of thing are you aware of that do you try to put processes in place to not you know, chew up your own brain by by sort of worrying at these things and thinking back over them, or or is it something you can't help doing at this point? It's difficult. Um, like for example, my net session that I just had, I didn't get this one shot right, and I've been mm. trying to think about what I should do about it for like half an hour now. Um, yeah. So it is frustrating and it's tough because it's very psychological. Um, if you have one bad game, that's all you can remember. If it, even if it's just one bad shot, then it's all you can remember for a while. Um, so it's definitely something that I have to like continually remind myself of, is to to try and stick to the positive. Um, I do have this book that I write down um, just a lot of thoughts and feelings and plans, and I feel like that helps me sort through my thoughts sometimes because sometimes you can get in a bit of a negative spiral on tour, especially. Just a way of getting of, it out. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of professional sports people and sort of high-ranking chief executives as well, they talk about yeah. the importance of journaling and, and, and yeah. sort of getting your thoughts out on paper in the morning. So that's a sort of a daily practice for you? Um, on game day, so I, I do it before every game. Um, it's just like what I want to do, what I've been working on, what's going well in the moment, um, and just kind of seeing it all written down, I think helps me feel a bit more calm and relaxed. Because um, otherwise I'd just be like a, a nervous ball of energy before the game, so right. it just helps calm me down. And then, I'm, then I know that if I stick to those points, then, then I'll be all right for the game. Some cricketers from quite early on in their journey, you can kind of see they've got that sort of captaincy potential. Like you can see they one day will graduate to that role. I've kind of thought of you in that way with the experience you've picked up along the way. Um, you seem quite a sensible character on the field. <laughs> Do you think that as well, that you'd like to lead this Proteus team into the future? Yeah, maybe one day. Um, it's not something that I've thought about too much yet. I um, always felt like I first need to sort out my own game before I can take charge of other people's games. Um, so, yeah, I feel like maybe that's something that I'll look into later on in my career. Um, I feel like I'm quite calm and collected on the field, so that could be good. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll see how it plays out. I think Sune is doing a, an excellent job at the moment leading us. So Sune is now doing it in the absence of Danae. So is the is the plan for Danae to come back and captain when she's back from injury or, or is this a sort of a, a, a longer term transition that we're seeing take place at the moment? Oh no, Danae is still official captain. Still the official captain, yeah. right, okay. Right, okay. And, and for you, it's kind of longer term. I mean, we talked about you having these options. You could go back and do medicine and so on. Do you see yourself yeah. being like the kind of player who might say by 28 or 30, I've, I've had enough, I've done my stretch, I started early? Or, you know, are you going to be one of those, like, hanging on at 39, you know, determined <laughs> to go one more round? Um, the more I'm playing, the more I think I'm going to be around for a while still. Um, right. I don't sort of like to leave things unfinished and I'd probably want to make as many runs as I possibly can and play as many games as I possibly can. So. And you want to win a World Cup. Yeah, right? I want to win a World Cup as well. So I'll probably be that, that old lady still playing at 39. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do so, you'll have made thousands and thousands and thousands <laughs> of international runs. Laura Wilbert, uh, thanks for being uh, such a great guest on The Final Word today. Thank you so much for having me.